In the previous lecture, we looked at the rise of Mycenaean civilization to the peak of its power in the late 15th and early 14th centuries BCE. This was a time when the Mycenaean kings, based in their palaces and served by a sophisticated bureaucracy, benefited from a trade network that stretched throughout the Mediterranean and beyond, from Italy in the west to Afghanistan in the east, and from Turkey in the north to Egypt in the south. This network was the foundation of what scholars refer to as the first globalized society, fueled by a robust trade in finished goods and valuable metals such as copper and tin, which of course created bronze, and the whole system was bound together by a very sophisticated system of diplomacy between the great regional powers. But during the last half of the 14th century, signs of trouble had begun to appear. The most dramatic evidence of rising levels of insecurity is the discovery of massively fortified citadels that had replaced many of the old, unwalled palaces. And as your Martin text points out, the walls of these citadels, these new walls, uh, were created with stone so large that the later generations of Greeks, when they surveyed these sites, uh, believed that no mere men could have built this. They had to have been built by a cyclops or a group of these creatures uh, called cyclopes, which you may be familiar with from the Greek myths. So very impressive structures, but of course signaling uh, to everyone that uh, Things are not quite what they used to be. So insecurity continued to mount during the late 13th century. So that's from 13 to 1200 BCE. The evidence indicates violence began to spread outward from Greece to the shores of Anatolia and beyond. Already slowing down during the 14th century, Mycenaean commerce seems to have broken down completely during the middle of the 13th. Exports of pottery from Greece cease soon after, or about 1230 BCE. And then sometime between roughly 1200 and 1180 BCE, Mycenaean civilization collapsed in a massive wave of destruction. The early evidence for the destruction comes from central Greece, the palace at Pylos was destroyed around 1200. The citadels at Mycenae, at Tiryns, and throughout the Argolid, this area here, were also destroyed around this time. The Mycenaean settlements on the islands of the Aegean and the eastern Mediterranean were also destroyed. Now, the collapse of the Mycenaean world corresponds to the widespread breakdown of civilizations throughout the eastern Mediterranean. The collapse of the Hittite Empire in Asia Minor, or, or what is now Turkey, occurs at about the same time, and the Amarna tablets, uh, which have been recovered from Egypt, record a time of great violence and general chaos. So, Two broad interrelated questions arise from this multi-regional catastrophe. Uh, number one, what were the actual causes? And two, how did the cascading sequence of destruction play out? So on the question of what caused this collapse of civilizations more than 3,000 years ago, well, as you can imagine, the evidence is fragmentary and inconclusive. It consists mainly of the legends recorded much later by Greek authors in the 5th century BCE. In the archaeological evidence that clearly indicates massive widespread destruction throughout Greece, Anatolia, and the Levant. But what could have triggered such a catastrophic downfall of multiple civilizations? Although there is no absolute scholarly consensus as to what exactly happened, I would refer you all to archaeologist Eric Klein's 2014 book, 1177 BC, The Year Civilization Collapsed, as a very useful summary of the evidence, which increasingly points to a perfect storm 
of multiple stressors, an epic drought, widespread famine, earthquakes, roving marauders, and more that topple these interdependent kingdoms like dominoes. So uh, first of all, drought. Sophisticated pollen sampling techniques and advances in radiocarbon dating have indicated that drought, uh, or rather a succession of severe droughts over a 150 year period from 1250 BCE to about 1100 BCE afflicted Greece and the broad Eastern Mediterranean region. Now, a drought this long is bound to lead to famine in these agricultural societies. So some of the cuneiform texts from Ugarit, which is located here, uh, that have been recovered, mention a famine that is ravaging the city of Imar. And Imar is located here in what is now uh, northern Syria. And this is around the year 1185. And uh, it says in the text that, uh, you know, there is famine and we will all die of hunger if you do not quickly arrive here. You will not see a living soul from this land. So again, begging for relief shipments of wheat from an uh, area that would hopefully be unaffected by drought and famine. And in a recovered text, the king of Ugarit is pleading with somebody, and we're not sure who, uh, for food to be brought to his kingdom. So again, there is famine in Ugarit and famine in uh, Imar, and uh, you know we have uh, evidence of other areas that are afflicted by massive famine. Anatolia, for example, the Hittite king is writing to somebody, and saying, do you not know that there was a famine in the midst of my land? It's a matter of life and death. So again, uh, no doubt that there is widespread famine at this time. So famine provides a broad context of crisis that will be punctuated by occasional earthquakes. Uh, now, in, if we turn to geoarchaeologists, they have determined that there was a heightened level of seismic activity along the eastern Mediterranean basin from about 1225 to 1175. So some major earthquake storms, as they're called, have uh, also uh, afflicted this region. So as Klein notes, you know, at Mycenae, we have houses that are just destroyed in an earthquake, and we have victims as well. Uh, some bodies have been recovered, some skeletal remains. Uh, and also, just three kilometers away at Tiryns, uh, we've got a woman, and women and children, buried under the collapsed walls that probably fell in uh, during an earthquake. And sites like Troy, the fabled walled city of Troy, well, they've discovered that uh, they've got tilted walls there that could only have been... Um, tilted at, at such an incredible angle uh, by a massive seismic disturbance. So again, an earthquake storm throughout the region, okay? So, you know, given the misery set in place by drought, famine, earthquakes, and I should mention there's a growing subset of scholars who want to add disease, um, most likely bubonic plague as the leading candidate, as an additional crisis factor. There can be very little surprise that all of this chaos could lead to internal rebellions and ultimately what is known as a total systems collapse. You know, as these highly centralized uh, palace regimes based upon this redistributed economic model, they are unable to deal with these multiple crises. And as the various palace regimes were overthrown, this very well may have led to uh, bands of desperate warriors uh, looking to raid or settle in territories they believed to be more prosperous or, or fertile than their own depleted homelands. Indeed, other recovered tablets provide compelling evidence of lands under attack. Again, if we refer back to the king of Ugarit, in a message to the uh, king of Cyprus, 
He says, uh, the ships of the enemy have come. The enemy have burnt my cities with fire and done terrible things in the land. From now on, when enemy ships appear, would you tell me about it so that I will be informed? And there's a private letter, uh, one of the last ones, they think, uh, to come out of Ugarit, uh, in which the king says, When your messenger arrived, the army was already humiliated. The city was sacked. Our food and the threshing horse was burnt. And the vineyards were also destroyed. Our city is sacked. May you know it. May you know it. So the textual evidence tells us they're being invaded, but we don't know by whom. Although suspicion has often rested on uh, what were called and are still called the Sea Peoples. Uh, the label that is used to describe large groups of marauders who just wreaked havoc on many of the regional communities, particularly those cities located in coastal areas, because again, the, the the mode of invasion by these raiders was by, uh, by uh, the sea. Now, in the early days of Bronze Age archaeology, say the mid to late 1800s, it was believed that these sea peoples were the cause of the collapse of the various Bronze Age civilizations. Since then, the consensus has shifted towards the belief that the sea peoples were a result of the destabilizing effects of drought famine, and earthquakes, which made life untenable in many parts of the eastern Mediterranean and Near East. So your Mar Martin text covers the Sea Peoples phenomenon in some detail on pages 41 and 42, noting that uh, these raiders originated from Mycenaean Greece, the Aegean Islands, Anatolia, Cyprus, and various points in the Near East. They did not constitute a united or uniform population. Rather, they should be thought of as independent bands displaced and set in motion by the local political and economic troubles of their homelands. Uh, close quote. And indeed, it is worth emphasizing that Bronze Age Greece was never united in one state, and there is a very real possibility that the rival princes or rival kings of Mycenaean Greece by the late 13th century BC were fighting each other at least as much as they were fighting uh, foreign invaders. The defensive walls at locations such as Mycenae and uh, Tiryns in the eastern Peloponnese could have served to protect these palaces situated near the coast against raiders attacking from the sea. But the palace at Gla here in central Greece was located far enough from the coast that foreign pirates presented no threat, but it too erected a huge stone wall to defend against enemy attacks. So the wall at Gla reveals then that Mycenaeans had to defend themselves against other Mycenaeans or perhaps their own mercenaries not necessarily against seaborne raiders. Now, as something of a side note, the theory of an internal collapse caused by political upheavals within the various Mycenaean palaces actually fits the historical possibility of a real and actual Trojan War, something, an event that uh, I'm confident you must have heard about. Indeed, you may know that the Greek tradition, uh, particularly via Homer and his epics, the Iliad and the Odyssey, recalled a massive campaign mounted by the Achaeans, as Homer refers to them, and these are the Greeks, uh, this campaign that the Greeks mounted against the wealthy city of Troy. Now, the strategic position of Troy uh, here at the mouth of the Dardanelles would make sense of a campaign to capture it. Archaeology has demonstrated that there were successive destruction levels at Troy, and the one of these levels, which is called Troy VI, would be consistent with the time frame of uh, a siege to take the city. And Greek tradition 
also recalls that few of the Achaeans, the Greek princes, returned safely to their kingdoms. Now, if the myth has a historical kernel, it may recall an expensive campaign that left the Mycenaean homeland weakened and subject to a wave of revolts. Now, remember, the Trojan War was said to have lasted 10 years, and you can imagine that if the leadership of all of the um, all the palaces, all the, the kingdoms in Greece were away for 10 years, uh, trouble is bound to occur, particularly if there is some sort of disturbance like a drought, a famine, an earthquake. So that's something, again, to keep in mind. Now, on another side note, I want to take a moment to talk about the role played by an ethnic group called the Dorians in the downfall of Mycenaean Greece. Now, your Martin text uh, discusses the so-called invasion of the Dorians on page 45, uh, noting that you know the later Greeks remembered an invasion of Dorians, and these are speakers of the form of Greek characteristic of the Northwest mainland. So they believe that these Dorians uh, were the reason for the disasters that struck Bronze Age Greece. But modern archaeology suggests that the Dorians who did move into southern Greece most likely came in groups too small to cause such damage by themselves. But as we shall see, once the Dorians uh, do settle in the Peloponnese, they soon become the dominant group in that part of Greece. And once established there as the dominant group on the Peloponnese, uh, these Dorians will become the rivals of the other two linguistic ethnic groups on the Greek mainland, uh, the Ionians and the Aeolians. And this rivalry over the centuries will grow very intense and will lead at times to open warfare. Indeed, this rivalry will be uh, something of a theme of the course, which we will be tracking unit by unit. And on another thematic side note, and I promise this is the last one, uh, that we will be building on for the rest of the course, uh, your Martin text on pages 41 and 42, uh, Martin cites the theory of historian Robert Drews, who theorized that new military tactics and weapons technology uh, contributed very much to the geo political upheaval uh, that uh, led to the collapse. And Druze argues that uh, during most of the Bronze Age, the major Bronze Age powers, uh, the kingdoms of the Hittites, the Egyptians, even the Mycenaeans, they relied on chariots carrying archers to win battles. So it was a very mobile form of warfare. And uh, these chariot forces, though, were supported by um, foot soldiers known as runners. Druze believes that they were mostly lower class foreign mercenaries uh, who hurled javelins with deadly accuracy that would disrupt the attacking enemy chariots. And then the uh, infantrymen would uh, close with the enemy, the now disrupted enemy, uh, and attack them with a new type of sword uh, sometimes this sword is referred to as the flanged hilt sword because, as we'll see here, the uh, blade and the hilt, uh, which were cast in bronze, they were cast as a single piece. And this was a great improvement over the older model swords because they allowed greater striking power. Uh, you could slash, you could stab without the risk that the blade would snap off from the hilt. And uh, again, this represents a major uh, improvement uh, in weapons technology. So by around 1200, Druze believes that these uh, hired foot soldiers had realized that they could use their, their long swords and their javelins to defeat the chariot forces on the battlefield by swarming in a, in a mass against the uh, vehicle-mounted uh, overlords and uh, thus take control. 
Now, even though most scholars believe that Druze put too much emphasis on changes in weapons and t tactics and not enough emphasis on the other factors we have discussed in this video, I mention his thesis because this will be one of the sub-themes of this entire course, how changes in weaponry and military tactics have effects on the broader political, geopolitical, and cultural landscape. And here I am referencing the hoplites and their phalanx, who will be introduced in Unit 3, or the Thetes of Athens, who we will examine in Units 5 and 6, and who, as rowers in the Athenian navy, saved Greece from foreign invasion at the Battle of Salamis in 480 BCE, and who were then subsequently instrumental in broadening the Athenian democracy at home and the Athenian empire abroad. So, to conclude, the interconnectedness that had strengthened these Bronze Age kingdoms may have also hastened their downfall. Once trade routes for copper and tin were disrupted and cities began to fall, Eric Klein says it had a domino effect that resulted in a widespread systems collapse. Now, not all civilizations were impacted equally. Some, like the Mycenaeans and Hittites, simply ceased to exist as, as civilizations. Uh, the Egyptians were affected, but they were, able, they were able to ride out the storm. They were able to survive intact. And so as we close out this unit, uh, I want to provide you with a sense of optimism uh, because our next unit will examine the aftermath of the Bronze Age collapse and we'll look at the painful process of constructing something new on the ruins of the old. And ultimately, though, we will witness a phoenix rise from the ashes. As Martin notes, to an outside observer, Greek society at the end of the Mycenaean age might have seemed destined for irreversible economic and social decline, even oblivion. As it happens, however, Great changes were in the making that would eventually create the civilization and the cultural accomplishments that we today think of as the Golden Age of Greece.